Hello and welcome to the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare's webinar on privacy, information and cybersecurity for digital mental health. We start today by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're variously meeting today. I'm coming to you live from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Great Eora Nation and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and also extend that acknowledgement and welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us for this session today. We also take the opportunity to acknowledge people with lived experience of mental ill health and recovery and the experience of people who are carers, families and supporters. Today's webinar is the second in our series of four and we're very pleased to bring to you some really important insights on a very exciting and timely topic, privacy, information security and cyber security. We've got a packed agenda today and also some very knowledgeable speakers ahead of our Q&A session towards the back of the webinar today. And please take a moment to welcome our guest, Dr. Victor Storm, Senior Clinical Advisor from the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, Judith Drake, Lived Experience Representative, Diana Weston, who is the Director of Health and Government Regulation and Strategy Branch at the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, Rebecca Markaloo, who is Technical Director in the Government Uplift Section at the Australian Signals Directorate, Australian Cybersecurity Centre. We also welcome Reza Tan, Clinic Director, and Joel Cunningham, Information Security Consultant at Mindspot. And finally, Sandra Rigby, the Project Officer for the Digital Mental Health Team here at the Commission. Now, please do make use of the discussion function, take an opportunity to introduce yourself and where you're dialing in from. And we'll also be taking questions as we move through each uh, of the presentations via our Q&A function. And you'll also have the opportunity to pose questions directly to our speakers during the live Q&A section. Let's kick off and move firstly to our senior clinical advisor, Dr. Victor Storm, for some opening comments. Thank you, Dr. Storm. Thank you, Chris, and welcome to all of our participants today. I imagine that we're all here because of the topic of today's agenda occupy a lot of our thinking, privacy, information and cybersecurity are central issues in our lives. The general issues affect us all, at work or in the daily life of our families and friends. Some even suggest the whole notion of privacy has disappeared in this digital age. Most of us who work in the health field have a digital footprint of some size. How much control do we have over our own footprint? But much more importantly, is how much individual control can we guarantee for our clients of the digital mental health services? What do we need to do to ensure that their privacy and security are protected? I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Judith Drake from a lived experience perspective, and she is also a much valued member of the Commission's Digital Mental Health Advisory Group. Before we hear from our panel, I would like to outline a few key points to keep in mind as the webinar progresses. The increase in the use of digital tools and technologies in mental health care has resulted in an increase in the amount of personal data being collected and stored. How do we protect this data from unauthorised use or access? There's always the ever prevalent cyber threats. The increasing number of cyber threats pose many challenges for those who choose or wish to engage with a digital mental health provider. And these can come in various forms. Uh, we all know about data breaches. You know, mental health apps often collect sensitive personal information, making them an attractive target for hackers and other cyber criminals. In the event of a data breach, individuals' personal information could be compromised. And then there's data sharing and monetization. Mental health apps may share data, user data, with third party organizations for monetization purposes, compromising users privacy again. If the app is so-called free, who or what is being bought and sold? And then there's just genuine inadequate security measures. Some mental health apps may not have adequate security measures in place to protect user data, increasing the risk of data breaches and information compromise. The challenge here is often keeping up to date with security measures in software and hardware. I anticipate that both Diana Weston from the OAIC and Rebecca Malu from the ASD will sharpen our thinking on these topics. In the Digital Mental Health Standards, there are several actions linked to privacy and information and cybersecurity. 
is action 1.10, risk management. And it requires providers to plan for and manage internal risks, including those arising from cyber threats. Then there's the group of actions 128, 129 and 130, privacy. And they articulate that a service provider's privacy responsibilities, including conducting a privacy impact assessment and having clear privacy policies. There's action 131, Transparency, which requires service providers to have systems for the collection, use, disclosure, storage, transmission, retention, and destruction of data. And finally, there's Action 135, Security and Stability, ensures that the provider uses a risk-based approach for implementing and maintaining an information security management system. I'm very much looking forward also to hearing from Mindspot, Theresa Tan, and Joel Cunningham on their approach to addressing these complex issues. And finally, today, Sandra Rigby will highlight the Commission's current resources that can assist your organisation to address these requirements. When it comes to digital mental health, privacy and information security, it is everyone's business. We hope that you find today's discussion with our experts useful and draw on some of the practical guidance to support safe privacy and information security management practices in your organisations. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Victor, for setting the scene so well for us today. We're now going to hear from Judith Drake, our lived experience representative. Unfortunately, Judith wasn't able to join us online today, however, recorded some very personal insights for us to share with you on how important privacy and information security is for users of digital mental health technologies. Thank you, Judith. Hi, my name's Judith. I'm recording today from Wurundjeri Country, and I sit on the Safety and Quality Commission's Digital Mental Health Advisory Group as a consumer representative. The increasing use of digital mental health services has many benefits, including for people in rural areas or those with accessibility challenges. But it does mean that providers need to be mindful of additional risks that they may need to identify, manage and mitigate. One of the biggest concerns for users of digital mental health services is how our data will be used, stored and shared. Privacy and confidentiality are so important when you're dealing with people's personal medical information, and this is especially relevant when talking about the areas covered by the standards, mental health, AOD and suicide prevention. When we use a service, we want to know that what we disclose to you will be kept confidential and our privacy won't be compromised. This can be even more important when there are additional factors that could put us at risk, such as family violence, child custody disputes, registered health practitioners seeking support for their own mental health, or people who might be in the public spotlight. Personally, I like the option to remain anonymous when using an app or online program, but for more intensive or hybrid supports, this isn't always possible. But when I hand my health and my personal and health data over to an organisation, I need to know that it is safe. Yes, there is some responsibility on me as a consumer to check that the provider I'm using is reputable. And I might do this by checking with a trusted person like my psychologist or GP, or by ensuring that the provider meets the appropriate standards. But there's also a lot of responsibility on you as a provider to ensure that you do the right thing. Cybersecurity and data privacy cannot be taken for granted. You need to prioritise these areas, invest in them, anticipate adverse events, and have policies and procedures in place, both to prevent a breach, but also to know how to respond appropriately if one does occur. Sure, you might have cyber liability insurance, but if I'm honest, by that stage, it's actually too late. My data's already out there. I'm not a tech expert or a cyber geek. I don't know my ROMs from my RAMs and I still get bytes and bits mixed up. But I do know how devastating it can feel when an organisation I trusted with my personal data lets me down. I'm a past client of Medibank. Back when I joined, they were called Medibank Private. At least the change in name has been apt. As a client of Medibank, I accessed various mental health services, including digital mental health. So it was very distressing late last year to receive a series of nine emails over a two month period, aggressively informing me of a recent cyber incident, unusual activity on their IT network. Nothing I hadn't already heard on the news, references to ongoing forensic investigations, and then eventually cyber crimes affecting their actual Medibank customers and not just their international student or budget AHM clients as if somehow their privacy was less important. I was left with many unanswered questions and told that it was important I remain vigilant 
because apparently an anxiety disorder and trauma history don't leave me quite hypervigilant enough. The last email in mid-December advised that my data had now been released on the dark web. They're truly sorry this has happened and recognise the distress this may cause me. I'm glad they could recognise my distress because it all left me confused, angry, uneasy and discombobulated with no idea of what these wordy emails actually meant, the practical implications or how I honestly felt. If you run a service that provides digital mental health services, I would implore you to plan in advance about how you will communicate with your clients if a cyber breach does occur. If possible, involve lived experience experts with an understanding of cultural competency to ensure your communications meet the diverse needs of your clients and not just the lawyers advising you. Many of the people accessing digital mental health services are already quite vulnerable. We might be stressed out, struggling with day-to-day -day life and anxious. We might be depressed, experiencing suicidality or paranoia. We may have language and literacy limitations. You need to take these into account when composing correspondence. The other point I would really like to make is that digital security and privacy isn't just something for IT executives to worry about. It's actually everyone's responsibility, no matter the role in your organisation. I've lost count of the number of providers who have sent out group emails and failed to BCC recipients, inadvertently sharing my name and email with everyone they're contacting. This is particularly an issue if you're using a service where it's obvious that you're a mental health consumer or carer and may not want to disclose this to others. One smaller organisation I was involved with took this mistake even further with simple human error and poor procedures. An employee was emailing out a newsletter and instead of attaching the file containing the newsletter, she accidentally attached the database she was extracting the emails from. This meant that my name, address, phone number, concession, status and email, along with about 100 others, got emailed to everyone. I can easily understand how a simple mistake like this can occur if you're distracted or select the wrong file. But it felt like a big betrayal by an organisation I trusted and could potentially have put me at risk had there been someone on that list who I didn't want to know my personal details, including where I lived. In this case, when I pointed out the mistake, the CEO rang me personally, acknowledged the mistake, apologised, took full responsibility and advised me that she would be notifying the department that funds them in line with privacy legislation reporting requirements, reassured me the attached file had only gone to those included in it, and then they went on to completely revise their processes so that instead of manually extracting emails, they now use a commercial program like MailChimp. This incident does highlight that one stressed out staff member can still cause a significant privacy breach, despite no hacking, criminality or ill intent. In an even more recent example, I was accessing an NDIS support usually delivered over the phone, but on this occasion was being held via Zoom in an attempt to demonstrate how to navigate a website. The worker shared her screen with me, but failed to notice she was logged into another client's record, and so accidentally shared that client's full name and NDIS number on the screen. Data security is just as important when you're a single provider delivering a one-on-one -on -one service online. I've also heard stories of people working from home and passwords being left by computers, potentially even visible on camera. Everyone in your organisation needs to be mindful of cyber security, privacy and confidentiality all of the time with every interaction they have. It needs to be built into all of your policy and procedures from the highest level of governance down to the day-to-day -day routine admin because otherwise not only might you cause your service users considerable distress and worry, put our safety at risk and cost your insurers significant amounts in class actions, but the next time someone like me gives a talk at an event like this, it could be your organisation's reputation on the line. Thank you. A very big thank you to Judith. And I think we can all agree there's some very powerful and personal words there for us all to reflect on. We heard a few themes there, including the importance of good privacy practices. So I'm delighted to welcome our next guest, Diana Weston, from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to provide some insights into how providers can practically address some of those privacy challenges. And a reminder, please pose any questions in the Q&A space and we'll attempt to answer those as we go. Welcome, Diana, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for that introduction, Chris, and to the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare for inviting me to speak today on privacy relevant Australian laws and regulations. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us today. 
I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I pay my respects to elders past and present, and I extend that respect to First Nations peoples here today. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, or OAIC, is Australia's federal privacy and freedom of information regulator. We regulate both the Australian Privacy Act and Freedom of Information Act. We're an independent statutory body, and our mission is to increase public trust and confidence in the protection of personal information and access to government held information. So what is privacy? Privacy is a fundamental human right that underpins freedom of association, thought and expression, as well as freedom from discrimination. Privacy is all about the degree to which personal information about individuals is known to others and how it is used or misused. The Privacy Act applies to most Australian government agencies, as well as any organisation with an annual turnover of more than $3 million and some other organisations. For example, many of you will know that regardless of turnover, the Privacy Act applies to all organisations that provide a health service or hold health information. These organisations are considered to be a health service provider, even if it is not their primary activity, and they are covered by the Privacy Act for all of their activities. And if your organisations are dealing with Australian government agencies, you should be aware that agencies must comply with the Australian Government Agencies Privacy Code. The code imposes heightened obligations on Australian government agencies, such as the requirement to conduct a Privacy Act assessment or PIA for all high privacy risk projects. A Privacy Impact Assessment is a systematic assessment of a project that identifies the impact that the project might have on the privacy of individuals and then sets out recommendations for managing, minimising or even eliminating that impact. And as Judith earlier rightly pointed out, the pendulum needs to shift the burden from the shoulders of individuals to those organisations which seek to derive commercial and public benefits through collecting personal information. You must be proactive and act as the trusted custodians of personal information. And privacy impact assessments are an important component, component in the protection of privacy and should be part of the overall risk management and planning process. Our guide to undertaking privacy impact assessments can be found on the OAIC's website. So the Privacy Act also establishes the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme, and organisations must notify affected individuals and the OAIC when they experience a data breach that is likely to result in serious harm to those individuals. Eligible data breaches are those that meet three tests. Firstly, personal information has been lost or accessed or disclosed without authorization. Secondly, it's likely to result in serious harm to one or more individuals. And finally, the organization has not been able to prevent the likely risk of serious harm with some sort of remedial action. Now the OASC publishes detailed statistics about notifications we receive. And we do this to help organizations understand current trends and risks and improve the security posture to minimize the risk of data breaches. And what we found is that most data breaches, around 60%, have been caused by malicious or criminal attack. Many of these breaches involve cybersecurity incidents, such as phishing or ransomware. But as Judith noted, human error is also a large contributor, accounting for around 30% of data breaches. And across the life of the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme, we receive notifications from almost all sectors of the Australian economy. However, health service providers were the number one notifier in our most recent report. It is important to remember that community trust is not necessarily extinguished immediately after a data breach occurs. What we've seen is that a quick and effective response to a data breach that puts individuals first can actually have a positive impact on people's perceptions of an organisation's trustworthiness. Now I'll move on now to talk a little bit about reform of the Privacy Act. The Privacy Legislation Amendment, Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022 was passed in the wake of the recent significant cyber incidents and commenced on the 13th of December 2022. The bill significantly increased the potential penalties for serious or repeated privacy breaches. So you could now be up for a penalty of $50 million, three times the value of any benefit obtained, or 30% of your turnover, whichever is the greatest. Another key reform from an enforcement perspective 
is the simplification of extraterritoriality provisions. This bill also strengthened the NDB scheme by providing the Commissioner with new information gathering powers and enhanced the OAIC's assessment or audit powers. Finally, the bill provided the Commissioner with new information sharing and publication powers, which will help ensure the community is aware of privacy issues and can be reassured that OAIC is performing its duty. The bill, however, is one part of a broader law reform process. The government is looking to publish a report with final recommendations for privacy law reform early this year. And I'll finish off with a few key points. COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of digital technology, particularly in the mental health sector. What's become very clear over this time and has been cemented even further with the high profile data breaches of recent months is the fundamental role that upholding privacy plays in building and maintaining trust. For digital mental health service providers in particular, putting the individual and their privacy rights at the centre when developing and supplying services and products will support community trust and engagement. We're seeing many health service providers focus not only on what harms good privacy practices can prevent, but what privacy can enable. By making privacy an organisational priority, you'll be able to innovate with confidence and strengthen your relationships with your clients and the community. To find out more about how you can make privacy a priority and access a wide range of resources, please visit our website at oaic.gov.au. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And again, some really important and relevant points there for us to consider. Now, as we've heard a couple of times already today, the risk of cybersecurity threats continue to increase. And so we're really pleased to welcome Rebecca Markaloo from the Australian Signals Director at Australian Cybersecurity Centre to talk about some of the practical strategies to support service providers in terms of improving information security practices. Welcome, Rebecca. Hello. My name is Rebecca Markaloo, and I'm one of the technical directors at the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. Firstly, I'd like to tell you a bit about our organisation for those that are not familiar with who we are and what we do. The Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the ACSC, within the Australian Signals Directorate, the ASD, leads the Australian government's efforts on national cybersecurity. The ACSC brings together cybersecurity capabilities from across the Australian government to improve the cyber resilience of the Australian community and to help make Australia the most secure place to connect online. ACSC services include the Australian Cybersecurity Hotline, which is contactable 24 hours a day, seven days a week via 1300 Cyber One. The hotline provides advice and assistance to Australian organisations impacted by cybersecurity incidents. Advice and guidance about how to protect yourself and your business online via our website at cyber.gov.au and the ACSC's partner portal. Publishing alerts, technical advice, advisories and notifications on significant cybersecurity threats, cyber threat monitoring and intelligence sharing with our partners in Australia and overseas to counter cybersecurity threats, joint cybersecurity centres that support collaboration between over 80,000 Australian organisations, exercises and uplift activities to enhance cybersecurity resilience for Australian organisations. In Australia, the ACSC saw an increase in the number of and sophistication of cyber threats making cybercrime like extortion, espionage and fraud easier to replicate at a greater scale. The ACSC received over 76,000 cybercrime reports, an increase of 13% from the previous financial year. This equates to one report every seven minutes. As a consequence of recent global events, Australia's dependency on the healthcare sector has significantly increased, both for life-saving medical care and vaccinations, and has dramatically changed the way the health sector operates, introducing virtual ways of doing business, such as health, telehealth. Malicious cyber actors continue to target Australia's healthcare sector because of its highly sensitive personal data holdings, intellectual property on technology and research, particularly that which relates to vaccine research and development, 
need to maintain and if disrupted, rapidly restore business continuity. As you can see from the graph, excluding government sectors, which have some additional reporting obligations, the healthcare and social assistance sectors reported the highest number of cybersecurity incidents during 2021 to 2022 financial year. Overall, these incidents are increasing in severity and impact. Ransomware and data breach related cybersecurity incidents remain the most highly reported in the healthcare and social assistance sectors. Ransomware is one of the most serious threats faced by the healthcare sector organisations, increasing in number over the past two years and as a proportion of the sector's total incidents. In case study one, before disbanding, the Conti Ransomware Group actively targeted medium to large organisations and critical infrastructure. Conti are known to implement the double extortion technique by exfiltrating and encrypting critical files, preventing access to business critical systems, giving the malicious actor additional leverage to collect ransom payments. The ACSC was aware of an increase in the domestic and global Conti activity throughout 2021 and 2022. The healthcare and social services sector was associated with the highest frequency of incidents that the ACSC responded to between May 2021 and March 2022. Conti have claimed to have compromised at least 500 organisations worldwide to date. In particular, healthcare organisations were routinely compromised and exploited by Conti's ransomware attacks. In case study two, the Reval ransomware group targeted medium-sized businesses in the Australian healthcare sector, encrypting critical files and preventing access to critical business systems. The malicious actor demanded several hundred thousands of dollars in exchange for the de decryption keys and an assurance that the stolen data would not be publicly released. Even with the involvement of specialists, ransomware incidents can take months to resolve. In this instance, Despite the engagement of a law firm, a third party negotiator and an insurance company and a willingness by the victim to pay the ransom, resolution and restoration of data took approximately three months, severely impacting business operation for the victim. Regardless of the size of the victim, ransomware can be an expensive thing to resolve. The most immediate costs come from the lost productivity due to system downtime and the time and money needed to rebuild systems following an incident. The legacy of a ransomware incident poses additional challenges, such as tarnishing a victim's rep reputation among its customers. The ACSC advises healthcare sector organisations to invest in preventative cybersecurity measures, such as enabling multi-factor authentication by default, having resilient backups, and conducting prompt patching of software, operating systems and devices to protect themselves from malicious activity. A preventive approach remains the best defence against cybersecurity incidents and is the most cost effective when compared with the costs incurred during the recovery from incidents or risk of repeated compromise. Preparation can significantly reduce the impact of a cybersecurity incident and enable swift restoration of services if they are degraded as a result. Healthcare sector organisations are advised to adopt multiple layers of defence against malicious actors as no single mitigation will protect against all threats. Organisations should consider adopting the ACSC's strategies to mitigate cybersecurity incidents with a particular focus on the Essential 8. The Essential 8 maturity model, which is updated regularly, can support the healthcare sector organisations in implementing the Essential 8. It is based on the ACSC's experience in producing cyber threat intelligence, responding to cyber security incidents and conducting penetration testing. Small and medium sized businesses in the healthcare sector should read the ACSC small business guides and technical examples, which have been specifically designed for small business to understand, take action and increase their cyber security resilience against cyber security threats. It includes simple mitigation strategies that have been derived from the Essential 8 and are written in a clear language. Limit where and how information is stored, accessed and processed. Consider the devices used to provide services and how they're being secured. 
reduce the threat to these devices by limiting their use for only work purposes. Health sector organisations should prepare for a cybersecurity incident by having a cybersecurity incident response plan, a business continuity plan, and a disaster recovery plan in place, and testing them regularly. A cyber incident response plan template and a cyber incident response readiness checklist are available via our website at cyber.gov.au. Testing that involves restoration of systems, software, and important data from backups provides an opportunity to review and improve in a controlled environment. Cybersecurity incidents can attract public and media interest, particularly if they compromise customer or client data or disrupt supply of goods and services. As such, organisations should prepare for communicating publicly about cybersecurity incidents, including incident response activities, and plan for how they will keep customers and clients, stakeholders, and the broader public informed. The ACSC understands reasons why organisations may be reluctant to report cybersecurity incidents or share their technical investigation reports with the ACSC. Each report provides visibility and informs the national cyber threat picture. For example, in March 2022, an Australian organisation was targeted by ransomware, resulting in the theft of data. During the engagement with the ACSC, the organisation provided indicators of compromise, which the ACSC shared anonymously on their behalf through the CETAS portal. This enabled organisations to protect themselves, ultimately strengthening the security of Australian organisations. Reporting incidents enables government agencies to provide assistance and prevent future cyber incidents. In September 22, the Australian Federal Police partner-led Operation AUKUS, which partners with the ACSC, retrieved a number of decryption keys for the Deadbolt ransomware group. This enabled around 90% of the reported victims to access their files and sensitive data, including a number of Australian victims. Victims that reported the incident were the first to get access to their files. Those that did not had a low chance of getting their information back. The ACSC Partnership Portal is available through the ACSC Partnership Program. It is derived through ACSC's network of joint cybersecurity centres, physically located in Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth and Sydney, along with outreach services virtually located in Darwin and Hobart. If you are currently not a partner, I highly recommend your organisation register to become a partner via our website at cyber.gov.au. The ACSC Partnership Program enables the Australian organisations and individuals to engage with the ACSC and fellow partners, drawing on collective understanding, experience, skills and capability to lift cyber resilience across the Australian economy. Partners can access a wide range of resilience building activities and materials through the ACSC Partnership Program provided by both the ACSC and other partners. Resources include dedicated workshops and training sessions on incident response, exercise planning and conduct, and specific technical topics. The ACSC constantly monitors cybersecurity threats from a range of local and global sources, including through government and business computer emergency response teams around the world. As a partner, you will have access to the threat intelligence consisting of context-rich and actionable and timely information in a variety of formats, including alerts and advisories and automated indicator sharing. Finally, to get in touch with the ACSC, you can contact us via the web, email or phone. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. And I really hope that we have the opportunity to tease out some of those concepts in a little bit more detail during the live Q&A section. So now we're going to hear from a service provider's perspective, and I'm really pleased to uh, have Reza Tan and Joel Cunningham from Mindspot join us today. And they're going to talk a little bit around how they're addressing aspects of privacy, information, and cybersecurity to support safe care of digital mental health service users. Thank you, Reza and Joel. Hello, uh, we're from the Mindspot Clinic. My name is Reza Tan, and I'm the clinic director. 
Hi, I'm Joel Cunningham. I'm the Associate Director of IT and Development. In our presence today, we will be sharing um, our experience as a service provider in implementing and improving our information security. I'll start by describing the MindSpot Clinic and what we do. We are a digital mental health service, uh, which provides services to all Australians. We uh, help people with high prevalence disorders, such as anxiety, depression, and chronic health conditions. Uh, the service we provide includes psychological assessment, treatment, and also information. We are evidence-based, um, and we're funded by the Department uh, of Health and the Western Australian Primary Health Networks. We accept self-referrals and referrals by GPs and health professionals, and we support about 35,000 registered users every year. We sit under MQ Health, which is the Macquarie University's health service. A lot can be said about information security and our experiences, but in this brief presentation, we're going to focus on four key areas. Firstly, we follow several key principles, which includes the safety and high quality service delivery, which means in our uh, attempts to uh, improve the information security, we put the service delivery uh, as a primary focus. Uh, accountability and auditing. And as a small organization, uh, it's also important for us to leverage existing resources and the expertise of our lead organization. I'm going to hand over to Joel to talk about the challenges and the actions. Thanks, Reza. So starting with challenges and tensions, uh, we thought about having the right internal roles and skill sets to run this platform. Uh, MySpot has thought a lot about the right roles and responsibilities required for security. This review allowed us to think about what was missing and the kind of experience that would be helpful. We wanted to make sure we identified and correctly assessed risks and that we were working on the right items in the security roadmap and needed to have access to the right experience to achieve this. Uh, for data collection, you know, what to collect, when and how, we asked ourselves some of the following questions. Where do we collect data from? Are we collecting only information required to run the service? Uh, is all our information collection points secure? Our data storage use and disposal. So we reviewed where our data is stored and that we are retaining the data for the required time to meet our compliance obligations. Is the data housed in a secure facility? How are we thinking about data disposal when, the, when it is no longer needed? What data is needed to be internet facing to run the service? changing technology uh, risks and expectations. So the security space is ever changing. There were some high profile data breaches last year that put the spotlight on data retention policies. As part of our security governance, we have reviewed our own policies and considered whether they are still aligned with best practices. We also thought as new vulnerabilities are found with operating systems and libraries, how do we quickly detect that if we are exposed to them? And the cost of security. For a small organization, what is the right amount of money that we should be investing in security? This can be a challenging question to answer. There should be an ongoing spend, but also if there are any gaps, you may need to invest more. Because threats are constantly changing, it can be difficult to forecast the spend, as when a critical events occur, you need to respond and uh, assign the appropriate resources. So some of the actions that we've taken, we've completed a privacy impact assessment. This is required as part of the NSQ DMH. It was also a good first step for MySpot to test our privacy compliance. Do we, do we understand how data flows through our platform and the clinic and assess how this may impact the privacy of a patient? Uh, benchmark risks against the NIST framework. We wanted to reassess our security posture against the lightweight security framework. We were working with a security consultant who had previous experience in the NIST framework. One of the strengths of NIST is that it breaks down security into five functions, which are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Going through this process helped us identify and rate risks and update our IT risk register, but also understand what function they related to. Importantly, it was easy for us to use this tool to communicate with senior management about these strengths and weaknesses. Leveraging the university IT security team and their expertise. MySpot has been very lucky to be able to work with the Macquarie University security team for the past 18 months. Through this, we have been able to review our risks and improve our security governance in line with the university. Working with the uni and their security consultants has given us the confidence that we are executing the right security strategy. Uh, updated IT governance framework and accountability. 
As part of the process, we also reviewed and updated our ISMS and roles and responsibilities. In particular, areas around incident response were brought into line to be consistent with the university's approach. We also improved our vendor checklist and our security uh, application development standards. Committing resources and setting um, a security roadmap. As part of the IT security governance, we regularly review our IT risk register and roadmap. The risk register helps prioritize the work items in our security roadmap. From here, we're able to talk with senior management to make sure risks are being addressed with timelines they are comfortable with. If there are concerns, we can talk to them about what extra resources would be required to complete these items faster. Uh, thanks, Reza. Thanks, Joel. We're also undergoing the NSQ DMH accreditation, which provides uh, good guidance uh, for our actions. Half of the MindSpot staff are clinical staff who generally have uh, no training on information security. So we've implemented mandatory training on this topic to all clinicians and to all roles across the clinic. Uh, we also uh, try to build a service-wide culture and commitment to information security. So it's in the awareness of, of all staff members performing their work. We conclude by sharing uh, several lessons. Firstly, as Joel mentioned, the nature and the context uh, of risk uh, is ever changing. So we have to maintain a high risk awareness and recognize that there are no permanent solutions. In order for our efforts to be sustainable, uh, we realize that organizational commitment is essential and it's very important to uh, invest in ongoing efforts and resources to information security. Thank you very much. We hope that our experiences may be helpful, especially to other service providers who are present today. President Joel, thank you so much. Uh, again, some really great insights there, and it's wonderful to see how some of these concepts are being introduced into digital mental health service provision in a practical sense. So thank you for sharing your story. Lastly, before we move to the live Q&A section, I'm really pleased to invite Sandra Rigby, uh, our project officer from the digital mental health team here at the Commission to talk a little bit around some of the resources that the Commission and others have developed to support service providers thinking about implementing the standards and particularly those actions that are relating to privacy, information and cyber security. Thanks very much for joining us, Sandra, and welcome. In this presentation, I will outline the resources available to help you ensure you have effective privacy and information security policies and processes in place. I will include resources developed by the Commission, as well as resources available through the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and other organisations. We recommend the Guide for Service Providers as the starting point when seeking information about the digital mental health standards and developing your understanding of the privacy and information security actions in the standards. For every action, the guide provides a plain English explanation of its intent, purpose, and how it should be implemented. There are reflective questions to help you consider whether your service is currently meeting the privacy and information security actions. And you'll also find advice on the kinds of evidence you can provide to show how you are implementing the actions. The Commission has also developed two action guides focused on privacy and information security, developed from interviews with service providers. The Privacy Action Guide outlines the laws which govern privacy in Australia and explains the obligations of service providers. The guide explains what is defined as personal information and what is defined as health information. And it also explains what's involved in a privacy impact assessment. A summary box highlights the barriers and enablers to effectively managing privacy. The Information Security Action Guide describes the factors to consider when establishing an information security management system. It describes some common threats and vulnerabilities for an information security management system and outlines the six key steps in developing a risk management framework and the eight essential strategies to help mitigate cybersecurity incidents. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner also offers many helpful privacy resources. The Guide to Developing a Privacy Policy outlines your obligations under the Privacy Act and how to develop a policy that best meets your entity's activities. 
The Guide to Health Privacy describes the particular responsibilities health service providers have in safeguarding personal information. The OAIC also has a guide to undertaking privacy impact assessments, together with an e-learning course that takes you step by step through the process. And the OAIC has guidance on data breach preparation and response. In terms of information security resources, the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO, has developed ISO 27001, a standard that provides a structured methodology about the requirements for an information security management system. The Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources has developed a cybersecurity assessment tool to help businesses assess their cybersecurity strengths and areas for improvement. And the Information Security Manual, published by the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, provides detailed guidance on applying a cybersecurity framework using a risk management approach and protecting systems and data from cyber threats. It also provides guidance on how to prepare for and manage a cybersecurity incident. You can keep up to date with all our publications and news by subscribing to our Digital Mental Health e-newsletter on the Commission website. And you'll find all our resources on our resource library webpage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and apologies for that little technical glitch there. We're now going to welcome all of our guests back to the main screen for a Q&A session. And I'm really pleased to invite everybody back Thanks very much for all of your insights and uh, sharing some of those uh, really practical examples of how service providers can address um, privacy information and cybersecurity. We've had some really great questions uh, come through via the live Q&A chat function. So please keep the questions coming if you wanted to ask anything specific of our invited guests today. We might start with a question to you, Reza. This one came through via the registration portal a couple of days ago, and I think it'd be really good to set the scene around um, some of the difficulties that service providers might have when they engage digital mental health service providers. We had uh, someone ask um, how distressed and traumatized people who are seeking mental health support via a digital mental health service are informed of their privacy. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, as a digital mental health service, uh, obviously we uh, we provide services to consumers who who might be distressed and, and traumatized. So uh, we want to acknowledge that health information is highly sensitive. I think as Judith shared earlier, it, it can be uh, a source of stigma and, and also it can discriminate people if the information isn't protected. Um, People with a trauma background may also have particular bad experiences about how their sensitive information have been handled by other people or services in the past. So we um, we do uh, have uh, consumers raising concerns. So I think what, what we try to do to inform uh, people of their privacy uh, includes um, putting information through our website. Uh, we have a privacy statement and the terms of use. Um, we also have email communication. And throughout the consumer journey, there, there are various uh, messages um, that people can access. Uh, we also have uh, trained therapists who can engage uh, consumers in the assessment or treatment phase, and they can provide explanation on uh, the privacy and confidentiality, including how we protect sensitive information and address any concerns. Uh, so we, we try to ensure that people are supported to understand how we handle their sensitive information and address any concerns people may have. And, and uh, we acknowledge that when people are distressed, a personalized approach is best and often needed. Uh, it's very hard to ask people to read information. So we, we try to um, actively offer for our, uh, consumers to talk to one of our trained therapists where, where they can sensitively uh, explain and, and address any concerns over the phone. But um, we also acknowledge that a lot of people may not want to speak to a therapist. So we uh, we also receive uh, questions and inquiries via uh, email or uh, private messages. So when consumers uh, don't want to speak to us, uh, we also have uh, the therapist um, uh, addressing concerns as much as they can uh, in writing via email and private message. 
Thanks, Reza. I really appreciate those insights there. Uh, we also had another question come through via the Q&A function. And we know that since the advent of COVID, a lot of people are using video conferencing software in that client service user uh, type setting. So I wondered um, re either Rebecca or Diana, if you might be able to give a couple of comments on um, services like Zoom or Teams um, and whether they stand up to a level of um, privacy and security standards if clinicians are using those to engage with service users as part of therapy. Um, Diana, did you want to jump in first? comments on specific um, products so we don't sort of do that analysis of you know what products are suited to which types of organizations but I, I guess just in terms of um, broadly what we expect around security requirements and what it says under the Privacy Act um, the Australian privacy principles in the Privacy Act um, have an obligation under APP 11 um, to keep personal information they hold secure. So what we talk about is taking reasonable steps to protect that personal information from misuse, interference and loss, as well as unauthorised access, modification and disclosure. Um, so when we're talking about reasonable steps that an APP entity should take, um, you know, we don't, wouldn't say a specific product like Teams or Zoom. Um, would meet it for every particular organisation, but it's going to depend on the individual circumstances. So some of the things that you should take into account when deciding whether those products are meeting the reasonable steps obligation um, would include the nature of your organisation, including your size and resources, um, the amount of sensitivity, uh, the amount and sensitivity information that's held, so generally, as the amount and sensitivity increases, so too will the steps required to protect it. Um, what the possible adverse consequences would be for an individual in the case of a breach. Um, what the practical implications of implementing the security measure, including the time and cost involved, and whether the security measure is in itself um, privacy invasive. Um, so I think there's some of the broad things to think about in terms of just meeting those security obligations. Um, and I guess it's up to each organisation to, um, you know, make their own assessment of what, what products are required to protect the personal information that they're collecting, using and disclosing. Now, you. you wanted to add to that, Rebecca? No, I, th I think you summarised it really well. I think um, the only thing that I could really add from that perspective is, is the ACS is the same. We do not um, have a like preferred products list or an endorsed products list, um, but we do provide some great guidance on cyber.gov.au around web conferencing security. And um, additionally, our Five Eyes partner, the Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency also provide additional guidance for securing video conferencing. So really looking at the vendors that you are selecting and the products that you're selecting and then how are you actually configuring those systems or services to the most secure um, way possible. Thanks very much, Rebecca and Diana. And Rebecca, if we could just stick for you, uh, stick with you for the moment. Um, there was another question that came via the registration portal um, and it was, what do you currently perceive to be the biggest cyber threat for mental health services? And is it just located uh, to mental health services or does it extend out to the healthcare system more broadly? For sure. So at the moment, we currently are seeing um, reported to the Australian Cyber Security Centre. The reporting is based on the healthcare sector itself. Um, and the two biggest cyber threats that we are seeing related to that sector is ransomware and data breaches. And this is based on the data that is being reported. So this is why we kind of emphasise that the more you report, the better indications we get around the types of threats that are being targeted towards the sector. Um, the way to be able to mitigate these threats, like um, described in the National Safety Quality Digital Mental Health Standards Action Guide, is really great guidance around how to combat these threats. And it really lays out that where to start and what are the types of threats that you are trying to mitigate. And it does really address those ransomware and data breach threats that we are seeing constantly on a daily basis. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And as Sandra alluded to, uh, that is a really good starting point for service providers that are thinking about accreditation to the standards. And it provides some really practical examples 
uh, and step-by-step -step processes of how you can implement things like an information security um, management system and also uphold some of those privacy requirements which are stepped out in the standards. Um, Joel, we might cut to you now, and you touched a little bit around the NIST framework, which was a decision that Mindspot made um, to manage your um, information security uh, management system. Um, I wonder if you might be able to just expand a little bit more on what the benefits of using NIST were and why you went about choosing that for your service. Um, well, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think the for us is really about um, the experience that we had access to. And so uh, the SHIELDS team, which is the security uplift team at Macquarie University, um, had a security consultant that had worked in a, um, for organisations of a similar size to my spot previously. Um, and that's where his uh, experience lied. So I think um, that was sort of an easy choice for us. It seemed like a, a good fit. Um, but I think, you know, as long as you're using a security framework, um, you could be successful sort of using several of them. But this was I think probably this the most convenient one for us um, at the time and it, so I think it's a it's a good match for our size. And so does it largely depend on the size and the scope and the complexity of the service that you're running um, in relation to what direction you might go in terms of uh, a framework? Well I think um, if, if you were small and you didn't sort of have access to the um, to the resources that we did, I think um, I, I would go and look at the Essential Eight, which has already been mentioned here today. Uh, I think that's a great place to start and uh, it's got a maturity model as well. So I think anything that allows you to sort of systematically ask yourself a bunch of questions, go through them all, uh, honestly answer them uh, and then start prioritizing them. I think uh, that's, that's what's key, sort of a, a framework that, that you can understand and, and let you sort of get to your base point. Um, and come up with a plan on, on how to fix anything that um, so you weren't happy with. Great, thanks, Joel. Um, Diana, I might cut to you now. We did have another question come through around um, predictions on new privacy legislation. Uh, and whether or not there might be something in the next 12 months uh, in terms of changes to the current privacy legislation. Thanks, Chris. Um, so in terms of um, new legislation coming through, um, you know, our, our really our key message for how to, to best prepare for what's coming over the next 12 months and beyond is that entities really need to think about, you know, their current obligations and how they're complying with their current obligations. Um, because if you're doing that, then you'll be really well placed to comply when law reform comes into place. Um, as I mentioned before in my um, presentation, um, there has been some new privacy legislation come through. It's the first part of a broader law reform process. Um, that was the Privacy Legislation Amendment, Enforcement and Other Measures Bill. Um, that significantly increased penalties for serious and repeated privacy breaches and, and um, gave greater powers to the IRC to resolve breaches. Um, but just in the last week, we have seen um, the government um, released their um, recommendations. There was 116 recommendations. Um, so that's probably your first port of call in terms of what's um, what's coming next. Um, but I guess in terms of the key points um, of, of those obligations um, is, Sorry, I'm just going to refer to my notes to make sure I get it all correct for you. Um, yeah, some of this, I think the key proposals around enabling individuals to exercise new privacy rights and take direct action in courts if their privacy rights are breached, the removal of some of the exemptions currently in the Privacy Act. Um, and, you know, we're really supportive of these changes because they reflect the baseline privacy rights expected by the community. Thanks, Diana. Appreciate that. And we did have another question uh, in the discussion forum. And Reza, I think potentially you might be able to answer this one for us. Um, it says for digital mental health providers, is there a requirement built in to escalate to emergency services, i.e. the ambulance or the police, if the patient is assessed um, as being uh, at risk to themselves or, um, or at risk to others? And what are some of the impacts on this and, and privacy rights? Sure, happy to answer that, Chris. Um... I, I think having clear uh, escalation, risk identification and escalation mechanism is part of a 
good clinical governance and and and, and the standard covers requirements for clinical governance but this is not unique for digital mental health providers what what might be unique is how we identify risk and how we practically uh, um, escalate the risk uh, but yeah obviously uh, if we identify the need to escalate to emergency services we will um, we will we will do so to protect the consumers safety um with 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 these kind of escalations obviously there might be impacts on privacy so as much as possible we we try to uh, collaboratively engage uh, consumers in in their care uh, especially when it concerns their safety and most most people would would be uh, happy to cooperate and um but in in the instances where when when people are clearly unsafe and they're unwilling to keep themselves safe yeah, there might be we might need to breach confidentiality and call emergency services but that's very very rare and this is uh, probably also not a, not a situation unique to digital mental health uh, providers any mental health services would, would be faced with similar situations i hope i've answered that thanks Rosa. that's great victor if i could just quickly bring you in because we've only got a couple of moments to go um any comments in relation to that last question particularly around duty of care for clinicians Um, thanks, Chris. And I think uh, Reza has uh, addressed uh, most of those issues. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the central principles are that it's not unique to the digital format, it's to any health service. And it is really important when you engage uh, with uh, a new service user that you spell out uh, with them who them to whom they consent information should be shared, you know, to an, uh, their GP, to uh, any other health agency. And also, uh, it's fairly routine in, in specialist mental health services that you spell out to the consumer when you may have to talk to others, even if they say they don't want you to. And it really boils down to the safety of the individual or the safety of others, if others are identified at, at being at risk. And uh, most services are very clear and have quite simple, clear communication patterns, uh, met, you know, messages to any service user about when uh, privacy would have to be breached uh, to save either the, the individual or someone else. Great. Thanks, Victor. And that's a really nice place to finish. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to our wonderful invited guests today. And thank you to all of you who've uh, taken the time to join us online. Uh, if your question didn't get answered today, I'm sorry that we ran out of time. Please send us through an email to dmhs at safetyandquality.gov.au. We'll also be posting a host of uh, FAQs to the Commission's website in the next couple of days, and that will include answers to some of the questions that were posed during the webinar. A reminder that our next webinar is going to be held on the 4th of April 2023, and we're going to be focusing on clinical and technical governance as the next topic to tackle. Thank you very much for your time and for joining us today and we wish you all a great day. Thank you.